Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in Winning Cures Everything. It is the Friday, July 22nd edition of the show. I'm your host, Gary Seegers, and of course you can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. Today, we are discussing the Big Ten East. Seven teams, one national title contender, I believe. Only one. I might be wrong about that, but we'll see. Uh, We do have some pretty good teams in this division and, of course, rabid fan bases. So, if this is your first time watching the show, welcome. We would love to have you back for more of these. So, go ahead and, if you would, so kindly hit that subscribe button. Jump into the comments, jump into the chat, of course, and make sure that you like the video. That always helps us out, helps grow the channel. The goal is 7,500 subscribers by the end of football season. We are now over 6,100. That's more than I assumed we would have at this point. But uh, but yeah, we are steadily growing, rapidly growing. Uh, if you don't enjoy watching the YouTube, I totally get it. I'm a podcast guy myself. You can also subscribe to the podcast anywhere that you get your podcast, whether that is Apple, Spotify, etc. Go ahead and make sure that you are subscribed on that and while you're at it, go ahead and leave a nice five-star review over at Apple Podcasts and uh, well, a written one at Apple Podcasts, a five-star review on Spotify as well. All right, let's not waste too much time. I, I tend to go long on some of these. Hopefully, I won't today, but we'll see. Uh, we'll start off with the Michigan Wolverines, and Jim Harbaugh and his bunch had obviously their most successful season last year. I mean, just a massive, massive job by them. And, of course, there are big changes. New defensive coordinator, new offensive coordinator, etc. Let's go ahead and pull up the spreadsheet, my preview spreadsheet on the screen here. If you're watching on the show, if you're listening on podcast, you can just hear me talk about it. They went 12-2 and last year. And the postgame win expectancy said as much. Uh, 11.65 and 1.35. I only do postgame win expectancy for the regular season games, and the conference championship games. So, you look at what they did there, and just monster year. They were 11-3 and against the spread. Uh, Their projected SP Plus record for this year, 9.5 wins. 9.5 and 2.5, and so anywhere between 9-3 and three or 10-2. and two. It seems plausible for sure. And so, it, this is a, a good team, not as talented as last year. It wouldn't, it wouldn't seem... When you look at it, they lose Hutchinson, they lose Ojabo, they lose uh, Dax Hill, they lose Hassan Haskins. I mean, it's just big-name guys that were really, really good. First-round talent on that defense. We will start off, uh, let's talk about the offense first. All right, PPA per drive last year, number 34, number 25 in rushing success rate, number 55 in passing success rate. Uh, the team was was efficient. They were not a dominant offensive football team but they could, they could take advantage of teams that were weak at the line of scrimmage, for sure. The new co-offensive coordinators here, Matt Weiss, quarterback's coach, and Sharon Moore, uh, the offensive line coach. Uh, I'll tell you this, the offensive line looks like it's going to be pretty strong again. You know, I mentioned Haskins is gone, but you do have uh, Corum back. Edwards and uh, the wide receiver, Ronnie Bell, are back from injury. The, uh, the quarterback room is stacked with McNamara and McCarthy. I... I tend to lean that McCarthy is going to take this job at some point this year. Just a guess. But at the same time, that schedule sets up brilliantly for Cade McNamara to just come out and continue on with the job. The offense was number 16 in uh, scoring opportunities, but number 42 in points per scoring opportunity. So they did not take advantage of getting down into the opponent's 40-yard line nearly enough. It probably needed to get a little bit better than that. They were really efficient. Ran the ball 59.2% of the time. If they've got Bell back this year, it kind of makes me wonder if they're going to swap that a little bit, get it a little bit closer to maybe 50-50, somewhere around there. You you know when you were going up against a team like Ohio State, against Penn State, etc., you're going to have to be explosive at some point. So maybe with, with Weiss being the play caller, you could expect them to maybe try and open things up just a little bit more. Uh, We'll move over to the defense. New D.C. Jesse Minter, uh, he was the defensive coordinator at Vandy, but he was with the Ravens from 2017 through 2020. 
you're not there's no terminology that's going to be different here. You're not really changing schemes from what you had last year. Uh, you lost Mike McDonald. Mentor's the same guy. I mean, it's the same thing. They already know exactly what they're doing here. They lost three first round defenders, only got forty six percent returning production, and yet when you look at the roster, like I still think they're going to be fine. Like I think this team is is really talented. You got fifteen players with one hundred seventy five plus snaps back. Defensive line looks pretty strong. Like it's not going to be what it was last year, but it's still going to be pretty good. And you're definitely going to be more talented than the majority of the teams on the schedule. Along with that, uh, linebacker and secondary look okay. Uh, not much upper echelon talent, but you've got a a whole slew of good players. So I, I do like that. Uh, Michigan looks like they're going to be favored in 11 games this year. you got four games that are toss-ups. Toss-ups, to me, are eight points one way or the other. Right? Anything that is a one-possession game, I look at as a toss-up, which means that they've got seven games where they are eight games where they are either favored by more than eight points, or they're an underdog by more than eight. Now, I believe they're going to be more than an eight-point underdog at Ohio State, regardless of how they do the rest of the year. Uh, the over-under here is nine and a half. Uh, it's juiced to the over at minus 135. Their odds to win the conference are plus 550. Now, that's to win the whole conference. There are no odds on the division right now, and I wonder if that's because it, there's so much money right now on Ohio State that they decided to take it off the board. We'll see. Uh, let's talk about some keys to the season here. Expectations are high. I would imagine that there's going to be enough talent here, even with the schedule, uh, for Michigan to be able to win you know, a lot of games. Again, they, they typically do this under Harbaugh. I know the 2020 year still leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth, but they tend to beat the teams that they're supposed to beat. And this year, you've got a lot of teams that you're supposed to beat. The offense avoided third downs on 48.9% of its sets of downs. Can they continue the early down success this year? Again, Schedule dictates, kind of looks like it. Team was fast. They were violent last year on defense. How much do the coordinator changes and the loss of the NFL guys change what they do this year? And that's that's my question going into it. I look at this schedule. I've got a loss to Penn State. I could see them easily winning that one. I've got a loss to Ohio State. I don't think anybody's beating Ohio State this year, at least not in the regular season. I've got them 10-2. You know, could they drop one to Michigan State or Nebraska or at Iowa or something crazy? It, sure, I guess. I just don't see it happening a lot. So I'm, I'm going with 10-2. and two. I think that they are still going to be in a position at the end of the year when they play Ohio State to go back to the Big Ten Championship game. They're not going to be as talented as Ohio State, but they weren't last year. And they still whipped them. So you never know. You never know with these things. So I, I like... Michigan quite a bit here. I think that this team is going to be really good again, just maybe not as good as they were last season. So I I do expect big things for Harbaugh and that bunch. Now that does move us over to the Ohio State Buckeyes. Last year was a disappointment. 11-2 and for Ryan Day and that bunch at this point with the way that they have been recruiting. That's a disappointment. There's no other way around it. You can't sugarcoat it in any which way. They went 6-6-1 six, six, and one against the spread, and of course you're going to do that whenever you've got these massive lines that you're trying to cover. But, you know, it's just it's rough to look at. No, it's not anybody's God-given right to win 10 ball games a year. It's not anybody's God-given right to win every conference championship. But when you recruit at the level that Ohio State does, yeah, 10-2 and two in the regular season and not even making it to the title game, is definitely going to leave a bad taste in your mouth. So I I think everybody kind of assumed that they were past that once Urban Meyer left. But every now and then, you know, it's going to rear its ugly head. It is what it is. Post-game win expectancy last year was 9.21 and 2.79. So the stats would read basically that this team was 9-3 and as opposed to 10-2. and And yeah, there were were some spots where they just did not look great last year, for sure. Uh... Projected SP plus record this year is ten and a half and one and a half. So anywhere from ten and two to eleven and one is what Bill Conley's stats expect over at ESPN. I expect a little more out of that. Now the way that those stats work is your win probability in each game, right? And you just add all of those up. I I'm looking at it a little bit differently. I don't. Spoiler alert: I don't see a loss on the schedule anywhere. We'll start off with the offense. The 
offense here returns 72% of production. That's number 39 in the country. They've got the best roster offensively in the country, and I don't think it's close. OC is still Kevin Wilson, but we all know this is Ryan Day's offense. It, it's the best offense in the country. You got Stroud at quarterback. You got Travion Henderson at running back. Uh, you got Smith and Jigba and Harrison Jr. at, at wide receiver, et cetera. What about the offensive line, though? You got three starters back. Offensive line was pretty good, I guess. They weren't as good run blocking as they were pass blocking. Uh, they were number three in havoc rate allowed, but number 36 in stuff rate. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what the offensive line will look like this year. They were number one in passing PPA, but only number 37 in rushing PPA. I think they're going to let Travion Henderson loose a little more this year. And, of course, they got a whole slew of running backs behind him in that core. Uh, it showed, as far as what the offensive line was good at, they were number 110 in the country in rushing percentage. So they they just decided to let it fly. And I don't blame them. When you got wide receivers like that, I mean, you you better go ahead and roll with it. I do expect a little bit more balance this year because you there are going to be times where you need to get third and one. And, and I think they want to have experience doing that. So the schedule does set up for them to, you know, there, there's tough tests. Don't get me wrong. You got Notre Dame at home in, in week one. You got Arkansas State and Toledo at home. And then you got Wisconsin at home. So you got two pretty tough games in the first four weeks, but all of them are at home. Like, I I think they're going to be fine. Like, I think this team is just absolutely banana. I think they are double-digit favorites in every game. Every game. Uh, as far as the defense, Jim Knowles comes over, takes over the defense from Oklahoma State. Uh, he's replacing Coombs, of course. Uh, the secondary, number 92 passing success rate allowed, number 50 in havoc rate. Uh, they weren't great at stopping the pass. They weren't, I mean, they were better at stopping the run, but when you went up against a really, really strong running team like Michigan, I mean, they just got blown off the ball. It was kind of the same thing with with Oregon early. The biggest problem for them last year was lack of physicality at the line of scrimmage. I mean, there's obvious talent here. I mean, you look at that roster and, and tell me that these are not guys that you expect to be really good. They just could not get stops at all. They were number 123 in the country in red zone touchdown rate allowed. I mean, how in the world does an Ohio State defense, it, it's partly scheme and it's partly not being able to develop guys. Well, with Knowles coming in, you can develop. You've got a guy in there that understands what it means to take a guy from here and move him up to way beyond there. So I expect big things from Knowles. I don't know if I expect it all in year one. It, it takes a little while for his defenses to really catch on. You got 11 players back that had 350 plus snaps. One is a transfer. So you got 10 that are in the Ohio State system. But when you got a new defensive coordinator coming in with a whole new scheme, all new terminology, everybody's kind of starting on the same footing, whether you're a transfer or not. My question is how important is Tanner McAllister, the Oklahoma State safety? Um, how important is he to Knowles' defense this year? Like, what can we expect from the secondary? Because, I mean, they were number 92 in passing success, uh, success rate allowed. Like, you, you need to do better. you got to figure out a way to uh, to keep other teams off the board. Huh. Projected favorites in 12 games, there's not a single toss-up. Not a single game that will be within single digits uh, as far as the spread is concerned. I mean, this team is just loaded. The keys to the season here. You're going to need underclassmen to play key roles. Defensive line lost three of their top five. And, and that line did get pushed around at times. How quickly can Knowles come in and fix it? That's one of the keys. Other key, offense is basically going to have no issues. Turnover margin was awesome. They were number 14 in turnover margin last year. The kicker, Noah Ruggles, went 20 of 21 on field goals. Offense was number 40 in field position. The defense was number one. Like, special teams should be great. There's not really a weakness here. I mean, the win total is 10.5. It's juiced to the over at minus 220. You, you normally don't see that. Once it gets to about 220, you see that win total jump up to 11. It, it'll get there eventually. Uh, I, I don't see a loss on this schedule at all. I've got them going 12-0. I don't, I don't see anybody that can beat them, and that includes at Penn State. Like I, I expect big things from Penn State this year. I just don't see them even close to what Ohio State is. Not anywhere close. Uh, this is my Big Ten champion. I, this is a revenge tour for last year. And, you know, another year for Stroud in that offense, I think they're going to be awesome. I think really, really big things. So, big uh, big stuff there for sure. 
Now, let's uh, da, 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 da. let's move over to Michigan State. Now, Michigan State, I don't know exactly what to make of this team, right? I, I think, I think Michigan State was a year early last year, but at the same time, like they just hit on everything in the transfer portal, right? They went eleven and two last year. Let's pull up the stats. Uh, Went 11 and 2 last year. Um, Post game win expectancy, though, said 8.36 and 3.64. So, really, instead of 10 and 2 in the regular season, the stats would tell you this was closer to an 8 and 4 team on the other side. And now, projected SP Plus this year actually has them at 8 and 4. We'll get to my projection here in just a minute. But you got 39, uh, sorry, sorry, 70% returning production on, uh, not on offense for the whole team. Let me get my thoughts straight here. 70% returning production. That's number 39 in the country overall on the team. 69% returning production on offense. That's number 52. 72% on defense. That's number 31. So you've got some guys that have been in the system that understand what's going on, and yet they went out and brought in a whole new slew of transfers. Uh, Some big guys that I think are going to be really successful. Uh, the offensive coordinator is Jay Johnson. They are replacing Kenneth Walker III. He was a huge portion of their offense last year. Um, but, uh, you know, replacing him is going to be tough. But you went out and you got Wisconsin transfer, uh, let's see, Berger. You got uh, Colorado transfer, Broussard. Those guys have obvious talent. They could certainly come in and do what Kenneth Walker III did. Now, you've also got the quarterback, Thorn back. you got the wide receiver, Reed. They're back, along with six offensive linemen that played at least 150 snaps last year. Like, how big of a loss is Naylor, uh, Hayward, and the three offensive linemen? That's going to be your question on offense. I I don't think the offense was that good last year. They weren't super efficient. They were number 46 in PPA per drive, number 66 in rushing success rate, number 65 in passing success rate. You know, they, they were... They were good. They were just good. Like, they didn't beat themselves a lot. Turnover margin was number 43. They were they were okay. So, you know, like it, it, it's such a weird thing to look at. Uh, moving over to the defense, defense coordinator Scotty, ha- uh, Scotty Hazleton. The defensive line was good, but they're losing the defensive end, uh, Panasiuk and Beasley. And I hope I said that name right. If I said it wrong, correct me in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on my preview here. Uh, I want to know about the secondary. Like, they were number 104 in passing success rate last year, number 73 in passing PPA. All five starters are back in the secondary. Are they are they going to be improved going up against, you know, a passing attack like Ohio State, like Purdue's, et cetera? I mean, those, granted, they don't have to play Purdue again. I just, somebody is going to be able to throw the ball on you outside of Ohio State. And when that happens, do, do you have the dudes, Right. Um, I'm not, I'm not totally certain. I mean, in, in week three at Washington, I mean, they could be in trouble there with Kalen DeBoer's offense if they can't stop the air game. Uh, they're returning nine of 12 that played 400 plus snaps. They bring in transfer linebackers, Winman from UNLV, uh, Brule from Mississippi State, and the cornerback Speed out of Georgia. Uh, are these guys improvements? I, I mean, we'll see. We'll see exactly what happens here. This team is a projected favorite in seven games. And yet, on their 12-game schedule, they've got eight toss-ups. Again, if you're only listening to this segment, toss-up for me is any game that is decided or projected to be decided by eight points or less, one way or the other. So a one-score game is a toss-up in my eyes. Uh, They got eight of them. Eight of them. Just ridiculous. The win total here is seven and a half, juiced to the over at minus 120. So they think it's more likely that this team will go eight and four. Uh, Keys to the season. Was last year a blip, or was it actual sustainable growth? Uh, the win total was 4.5. They went 10-2 and two in the regular season. They were 4-0 and oh in one-score games. I don't expect that to be the case this year. Um, I, I brought up po- uh, post-game win expectancy, 8.36 in the regular season. I mean, it does make you question a little bit. Um, my other question here, will the transfers hit again? Like, what is a reasonable expectation for Mel Tucker? Is eight wins good? Like, would fans be happy with seven wins at this point? I mean, they won 11 last year. You don't normally like to see a team go backwards. So I'm curious. 
I just I want to know what to what the expectation is in East Lansing. That's what I want to know. I've got them going eight and four. Uh, I've got four losses in the middle of the of the schedule, but at the same time, like I just I, I'd see eight wins somewhere on there. So I think eight and four is totally reasonable. Don't think they're going to win the division. Don't think they're going to win the conference. Obviously, but I do think that this is Mel Tucker's building something here. And so, I, what's what's the tweet right now? Tuck coming. Yeah, he's he's doing some some pretty big things. So I, you know, I would love to see what uh, what the next step is. That's what I want to see. I want to see is is Thorn awesome. Is Jaden Reed awesome? Like, is this offense awesome even without Kenneth Walker III? That's my that's my question going into this season. All right, we're gonna hit some ads and and then we will hit Penn State on the other side. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, our gambling picks, our store, the gear we use, and more. Subscribe to us on YouTube to get not only the full shows, but individual segments, along with other goodies as well. We're over 5,600 subscribers right now, and our goal by the end of football season is 7,500. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. You can visit winningcureseverything.com slash store and see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, the Penn State Nittany Lions, James Franklin last year. Another disappointing year. And it maybe had more to do with the quarterback position and the fact that there was nobody behind Sean Clifford. I mean, that was what lost them basically two games at least and and maybe more down the stretch. Uh, This team was pretty good last year at the lines of scrimmage, et cetera. Uh, Offense was, I mean, just putrid numbers. I mean, just awful. And a lot of that was skewed by what happened when Sean Clifford went out, right? Right. Uh, they looked pretty good early in the season. Not the not the full offense, just the team overall was able to win close games early. And and then after that, I mean, it just all, the Iowa game was a disaster. They should have won that game multiple times over. But regardless, uh, let's dive into the numbers here. Post-game win expectancy last year was actually 7-5 and five in the regular season, which is exactly what they were, 7.04 and 4.96. Uh, their projected record this year is eight and four as far as SP plus is concerned. Bill Conley's numbers over there. Roster strength, though, I mean they're number twenty one in the country. This is a pretty strong roster when you actually look at the guys that they have in. Um, everything looked good last year, including like PPA margin, net points per drive, etc. Except for when it comes to offensive efficiency, they were just brutally bad. And Mike Yursich, the offense coordinator. He is there for uh, the second straight year, and it is the first time in three seasons that they've had a returning offensive coordinator. Sean Clifford's still the guy at quarterback. Everybody's talking about Drew Allar. Um, it, it's not Allar's time right now. I, I think incredibly highly of Sean Clifford. I don't know why. I don't think it's bias because I'm, I'm not a Penn State fan. I just I think Sean Clifford is going to have a really big year. So, But we'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, the running back, Nick Singleton, five-star, absolute stud. He's going to take over at running back. Should improve their rushing numbers. They were number 120 in rushing PPA last year. Had zero running game to speak of. So Singleton is going to be big for them. Offensive line, underperformed last year. I, I think that's the easiest way to say it. He got two starters back. They look strong via like recruiting rankings and whatnot. But, uh, but I do want to see what they end up coming into this year. Wide receivers, Washington. Uh, the Western Kentucky transfer, Tinsley, those guys are studs. I, I think you're going to be able to get a lot going in the passing game this year that you, for whatever reason, were not able to get going the last couple of years so long as Clifford stays healthy. Even if he doesn't, you know, you got Drew Allard coming in. I mean, you, you you got options. You got options this year. At number 109 in rushing success rate last year, number 89 in passing success rate, like those numbers, I just don't believe that they are going to get worse than that. So I expect a big bounce this year uh, to actually being a respectable offense. That's what I think. 
Now over to the defense, new DC is Manny Diaz. He's replacing Brent Pry, who of course has been with Franklin forever, but he went and took over the Virginia Tech job. Defensive line looks strong. Uh, they had some injuries that that really hurt them last year. Uh, the Maryland transfer coming in, the defensive end Robinson, uh, could be a key piece here. Uh, you got seven guys in the secondary that had 200 plus snaps last year. Uh, you forced third downs at a huge rate, number 13 in FBS in that. And while they allowed teams plenty of scoring opportunities, they, they were number 63 in that. They were number four in points per scoring opportunity. A scoring opportunity, by the way, is a dry, an opponent drive that gets a first down inside your 40-yard line. That's a scoring opportunity. So, number four in points per scoring opportunity. I think it was like six interceptions and three fumbles recovered inside their own 40. So, you might want to, you, you could call that luck, or you could just call that like being incredibly opportunistic and, and aggressive on defense. So, uh, this team is projected uh, to be a favorite in nine games. You got six toss ups, though. That's uh, the toss ups are games that are projected to be within one score. Looking at the keys to the season, like it feels like 2023 is going to be the year, but there's a lot of talent here for them to, to get to double digit wins. Uh, can Sean Clifford take like a Burrow Pickett kind of leap into his, uh, his extra year here? Uh, this is the first time he's had an OC for two straight seasons, and there's a bunch of skill talent. So, I don't see why not. Like, I, I, I saw some decent decision-making from him. I saw, like, a pretty good arm early. I, you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, as far as the line of scrimmage, are your offensive line and defensive line strong or are they not? I mean, you got tons of recruiting talent, but they haven't exactly impressed week after week. Like, it, they have shined in moments. But, yeah, you know, the win total here is 8.5. It's juiced to the under at minus 135. Uh, if you want to bet the over, it's plus 105. And I think that's the direction that I'm going to lean here because I've got this team going 10-2. and two. Like, I think this is going to be a really big year. I've got a loss to Ohio State. I've got a loss at the end of the year to Michigan State. Uh, I, I think this team can beat everybody on their schedule. Like, that, that big swing game in week one at Purdue is going to be huge. I don't expect really anything out of Auburn this year. So even though Penn State is going on the road, I still think Penn State is the significantly more talented football team there. I mean, you got Central Michigan, Northwestern. Like, I think they can win at Michigan coming off a bye week. Minnesota the next week, I I do expect a loss to Ohio State. Uh, But maybe this team goes like 9-3, and you know, and and would that be so bad? I don't think so. I think 9-3 and is a massive improvement from 7-5. and Get back to within shouting distance of... The conference championship game. I think that's the key for this season. So I've got them going ten and two. Wouldn't shock me if they go nine and three. Uh, you know, eight and four even really wouldn't be awful. But I don't think they want eight and four. Like it just, I, I don't think in state college that that's what they want. So I'm looking at nine and three or ten and two. And when I did my like when I filled out my schedule, I've got them at ten and two. And so I expect some pretty big things from the Nittany Lions this year. All right, we are moving on from there to the Maryland Terrapins. And this team, it can drive you nuts if you're not careful. Just it could absolutely drive you insane. Mike Loxley, 7-6 uh, and six last year, won the bowl game, um, swapped out defensive coordinators. You know, we'll talk about him in just a minute, Brian Williams. Um, this team is really good on offense and really bad on defense. And cannot beat anybody that actually has a pulse and hasn't been able to for years. Like, they always come out to to really hot starts and then lose a bunch of games and hope to God that they can find one of them against a really weak opponent where they can get to a bowl game. And it's the same thing year after year, and they did it again last year. You know, won four games early and then lost, like, what? Uh, I can't even do the math. Lost uh, six of the last eight. I mean, just just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Let's start off on offense here. Um, well, you, you know, let's do this. Returning production, 71% is number 36 in the country. Number 15, returning production on offense, and number 73 on defense. So, yeah, you would think maybe you take a step back on defense, but there's nothing to take a step back from. I mean, this defense was not good. So, if you're losing players off of a bad defense... Maybe that's a good thing. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, as far as the offense is concerned, Danny Nose, offensive coordinator, 
69% of their total yards came through the air last year. That was number 19 in FBS. Uh, it might be more this year because the wide receiver core that Baby Two has got coming back, Talia Tagovailoa, uh, they are legit. I mean, just absolutely legit. You got Jarrett, Copeland, Demas Jr., et cetera. The running back, McDonald, uh, is is pretty good. Uh, the The entire offensive line is back. I mean, the offense is going to be good. Offense was number 15 overall success rate last year, only number 44 in PPA per drive. Uh, they were number 30 in total scoring opportunities, uh, but only number 74 in points per drive. Like, you you got to finish drives when you get down there. They were not able to get touchdowns, basically. Uh, that's what the points per scoring opportunity really was. Um, and for those that don't know, scoring opportunity, drive where you get a first down inside the opponent's 40-yard line. So, I'm, you know, I like the offense, but I've always liked the offense. Like, I think I think Talia Tungvaloa is a star at quarterback. I think he's insanely good, and I think they've got all the skill talent that you could possibly want. Now we move to the defense. Defense coordinator Brian Williams, he called the defense for the last two games. They gave up 16 to Rutgers and only 10 to Virginia Tech. So, the two best defensive games that they had all season, he was calling. However... Circumstances do matter. Rutgers had no pulse on offense, and Virginia Tech uh, was missing a bunch of guys, had just fired Justin Fuente. I mean, it was just a disaster, right? So Maryland beat up on two teams that really they should have beat up on. Defense was number 79 in PPA per drive, number 127 in total scoring opportunities, and number 72 in points per scoring opportunity. Overall, the efficiency not great. They were number 79 in PPA per drive. They were number 89 in rushing success rate allowed. Number 63 in passing success rate allowed. So that was okay. Okay. Uh, injuries to this unit have not been kind. They they lost defensive end Darrell Inchami. I hope I said that right. If I didn't, you can correct me in the comments. Uh, along with cornerback Banks. So like early last year, that, that certainly hurt because you didn't have him for the rest of the year. You know, they got new transfers coming in. The edge, Cowan, you got the defensive end, Fuller, coming in. I I think that there's at least some hope. There's some promise here. And when you've got an offense that good that you can lean on, especially when they're not throwing, you know, five interceptions against Iowa or whatever. Uh, but when you have a team that you can rely on the offense to put up points, then the defense can take chances and they can be aggressive and they can do stuff like that. And I expect that from, from Williams. This team is a projected favorite in six games. Now, that's a, that's a little tricky. You got five toss-ups here. Toss-ups, of course, any game that is projected to be within one score. I I look at the schedule. I expect big things early. Um, you know, expect coming out coming out of the gate three and zero. I I fully expect that. But you do have two teams that can really score with you if your offense is not up to snuff. Uh, you got at Charlotte in week two, SMU in week three. At keys to the season here, uh, are they going to start quick and crumble again? I mentioned that earlier. It seems to happen every year. Like, can you actually beat good teams this year? And then number two, can the defensive transfers help improve the defense? Uh, the offense is going to need help with that brutal conference schedule, especially late. You know, win total here is six. It's juiced to the under at minus 125. Um, I've got them at six and six again. Uh, I've got them making another bowl game. A win against Rutgers, a win against Northwestern, and I've actually got an upset win over Michigan State. Um, you know, and then winning the first three games. Like, could I see them finding another win in there somewhere? Like, do I think they could beat Purdue? Yeah, sure. Do I think they could win at Indiana? Yeah, absolutely. Do I think they could probably lose to Michigan State? Yeah. Uh, but crazy stuff happens. So, I I think this team is going to be pretty good. The offensive skill talent is the best outside of Ohio State. The defense still has a ton of questions. So I I am looking at six and six. I think a bowl game would be another strong season for Loxley and maybe another step in the right direction. Keep showing up the recruiting class. All right, let's hit one more ad. We're gonna hit Rutgers and Indiana on the backside. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter, at Winning Cures, or you can follow the guys at GaryWCE and at Chris B. Giannini. 
Or you can also follow us on Facebook. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, we're moving into the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. And Greg Schiano, uh, five and eight last year, actually went to a bowl game with a five and seven record because of how good the school's APR is, uh, and will continue to be, I would imagine, so long as he is there. Post game win expectancy four point one two and seven point eight eight. That means this team was closer to four and eight than they were to five and seven, and it does make sense when you look at the screen, when you look at this spreadsheet, and you see all that red. This team was not explosive; they couldn't stop explosive plays. They were not efficient on offense, and the only saving grace really was the defense and the fact that the team did not beat themselves. Right, number 43 in turnover margin, number 32 in penalties per game. Uh, the team was okay. Projected SP plus record this year from Bill Conley is 4-8, and eight. and, you know, I I don't see four wins here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I don't see it. Uh, you've got... Number 56 in the country as far as returning production. A lot of that's on offense, 74%, but on defense, 55%. And, of course, again, defense was the saving grace. Defense is what got them to that bowl game. You're starting out the year on maybe not the right foot. You play at Boston College. I think that team's going to be pretty good. You play at Temple in week three. Uh, Temple is, is not a good football team, but that's another winnable game but you have to play it on the road. I I mean, this is, it's a tough schedule. This is a tough schedule. Let's start off with the offense. Nothing has really worked in two seasons under the offensive coordinator, Sean Gleason, other than some trick plays back in that 2020 season. And he tried to run some stuff last year, had a little bit of success with it here and there, but eh, you know, uh, the quarterback, no of a draw returns at quarterback, but he was number 111 in total QBR in 2021. Like I would imagine Simon or, uh, Wimsat could probably start this year. Uh, the offensive line is replacing five of their top six. They got four transfers coming in. They signed seven high school offensive linemen in this class. Like, it, they understand, at least Shiano gets it. Like, you got to get better on the line of scrimmage. Uh, the transfers, Harris from Syracuse and Ryan from West Virginia, uh, they should help a really, really unproven wide receiver core. The running backs... Uh, Manon Guy and Young complement each other really well in Gleason's scheme. Like, I, I I, think there's at least some kind of promise here to, to be better than they were last year, but my gosh, there's really only one way to go from the number 124 offensive PPA per drive team in the country. I mean, it's you don't get much better than that, or much worse than that. Uh, the passing success rate was number 113 in the country. Rushing success rate, number 84. I mean, just, ugh. Um Moving over to the defense, like this is where they were good. Uh, you got new defense coordinator Joe Harris Zemiak. Correct me in the comments. <laughs> Correct me in the comments. I am so awful at some of these names. Uh, he was the co DC and safeties coach at Minnesota for the last two seasons. Uh, we all know that this is Shiano's defense. He is a defensive guy, so he he is the one that really plans this thing. Uh, the defense, you know, again great last year as far as. It was the one thing that this team could really hang their hat on. I'll say that. They were number 19 in defensive field position, number 40 in points per scoring opportunity, number 39 in rushing PPA. Uh, linebacker is thin and inexperienced. You got 11 players with 227-plus snaps returning. So you do have some experience of guys that have been in that system. Like you, If nothing else, Rutgers has maybe the best pass rush uh, in years this year behind the defensive end, Lewis. The secondary is going to be maybe the strong unit. Uh, you've got the most experience right there. And yet, you know, projected favorites in two games. I mean, just uh, 
just not great. And you've only got three toss-ups. Again, toss-ups are games that are projected to be within one score. Let's uh let's look at the keys to the season. The win total is sitting at four and a half, but it's at it's not at a lot of books. I don't know why this win total is not uh, everywhere right now. Like uh, something, I don't know what's going on here. Is is what I'm saying. I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but uh but yeah, the win total sits at four and a half. It is juiced to the under at minus one twenty. Keys to the season, you got to find some explosive plays. Like they were only number twenty eight, uh, or no, sorry, they were only twenty eight. Um, I will say it right in a moment. They only had 28 plays of 20-plus yards in non-garbage time last year. That's number 125 in the country. If you swap to Wimsett, like, is that going to work? Like, it, is is he going to be the guy that really sparks some, you know, some explosive plays on offense? And we'll see. Defense uh, only has 55% returning production and a new DC. You got to imagine that Shiano's defense will be fine, but that's a lot to deal with when you got at Boston College, Iowa, and Ohio State in the first five weeks of the season, right? Uh, the fundamentals were good here. You know, number 43 in turnover margin, number 32 in penalties per game. It, there's, just, there's just nowhere near enough talent there right now. Now, I know that Shiano is working on that, but the losses that they took last year, I, I don't see... A lot of room for improvement. Last year almost felt like a miracle to get some of those wins. I've got them going two and ten. Could I see them winning another game? Could I see them maybe getting up to four? Yeah. Could I see them getting to five or even bowl contention? No, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, this is just a brutal, brutal stretch once they get into conference play. You've got Iowa at Ohio State, Nebraska. Then you get a bye week and you play Indiana, which I think. They could reasonably beat Indiana. But after that, at Minnesota, Michigan, at Michigan State, Penn State, at Maryland. Like, at Maryland, they that was, that was a team that maybe they could have hung with last year if they had any hope of an offense. Maryland's offense is going to roll this year. And you have to deal with those fast, fast wide receivers in the last game of the year after playing Minnesota, Michigan, Michigan State and Penn State all in a row. <laughs> like, it's that's a disaster. So this schedule did not set up well for them. I, I've got them at two and ten. Got them at two and ten. I wish good things for the State University of New Jersey. Um, but it is what it is. You know what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? All right, we'll move on. Last one for the evening here, uh, or for the day. Uh, as I, I'm sure you noticed that I'm recording this uh, on July 21st on at, at night. It, it's actually 11.18 p.m. Now, it's going to go out live tomorrow around lunch. But, yeah, had to, had to go in and get this done. My schedule's been a little jacked up this week. I'll say that. And you can certainly hear it in my voice. The Indiana Hoosiers and Mr. Allen, last year was not a good year for him. I will say that. Tom Allen went 2-10 and ten last year with the Hoosiers. Post-game win expectancy did say that they should have been closer to 3-9, and nine, but this team lost every Big Ten game. Um, your returning production doesn't point to anything great coming back. Yet you're number 87 in the country as far as returning production, 57%. You lose the linebacker, McFadden. He, he was an absolute stud. You lose uh, Peyton Hendershot. You lose the running back, Stephen Carr. Um, let I mean, you see all this red on here. I mean, it is just this team was so bad last year. Number one twenty six in PPA per drive on offense. Um, let's start off with the offense. Let's do that. New offense coordinator is Walt Bell, former Florida State offensive coordinator, former UMass head coach. How does this guy continue to get jobs? Like I just do not understand it. He he wasn't good as the OC at Florida State. He wasn't good as the head coach at UMass, like he must be one hell of a networker. Like, absolutely. Uh, Missouri transfer Connor Bazelak comes in. He looks like he's going to be the starter quarterback. You do have the running back, Sean Shivers, coming in from Auburn. Like, he's going to allow you to do a lot of really fun stuff and whatnot. I think he's going to start at running back. You got 2021 Florida State transfer DJ Matthews that transferred in last year, but went out after, I think, only four games. So you didn't even really get him. 
offense was just bad across the board. I mean, they were number 124 in overall success rate. The offensive line returns three starters from a not good unit. I mean, there's just there's not a lot to look at and be hopeful for here. Uh, moving over to the defense. Like, this is normally where Tom Allen would, would be able to stand and say, this is the identity of our team. And last year was not it at all. Minnesota defensive line coach Chad Wilt is the new defense coordinator, but uh, Allen has said that he's going to be more hands-on with the defense this year. He's going to be more involved with planning, et cetera, so I guess maybe that's good. They brought in seven transfers on defense, four of them at linebacker, where the only guy returning that had any meaningful game action is Cam Jones. Defensive line is going to lean on the defensive end, Brian, and the defensive tackle, Elliott, here. They were number 118 in points per scoring opportunity, and number 126 in takeaways. You've got to find a way to get some stops this year. Like, the secondary looks strong, but they only had five interceptions last year. So there's no ball hawking going on. Like, this is, whew, it was just a rough, rough year. This team is a projected favorite in three games this year. You got six toss-ups, so at least that's promising. Um, the toss-ups, of course, any game that is projected to be within one score, but I do not see it. I'm just, I am having a really difficult time uh, looking at keys to the season. Like, it's not easy to find anything to hang your hat on with this team. Like, the two coordinators that were really successful, that really led to good seasons for Indiana, they're now both fairly successful head coaches, like Kalen DeBoer and Kane Womack. Uh, can Basilak rekindle some of the magic that he had at Missouri? This is another key here. Uh, he, had, he had magic at Missouri in 2020. Not so much last year, but he, he was injured for the majority of last year. Uh, Shivers coming in from Auburn, that's a huge get. That's going to let them get at least somewhat creative with their scheme on offense. Um, and then, my gosh, if everybody thought the schedule was hard in 2021, like, it ain't any easier this year. Weeks 4 through 7 and weeks 10 through 13 are just brutal. 4 through 7, by the way, uh, at Cincinnati, at Nebraska, Michigan, Maryland. Like, imagine having to deal with that Maryland offense after three straight weeks of at Cincy, at Nebraska, and Michigan. I mean, <laughs> it's just brutal. And then, of course, you get a bye week over the, the Halloween weekend, and you get Penn State, at Ohio State, at Michigan State, and then Purdue. Like, you got to deal with the offensive juggernaut after dealing with, with those three? I mean, goodness gracious. I've, uh, I've got Indiana at 3-9. and nine. I just, I am, I wish good things for these teams like Rutgers and Indiana. But I just don't see it. And maybe you can look at it differently and help me out. Like, maybe you can tell me what I'm missing here. Uh, if you are a fan of this team or whatever, jump into the comments. I would love to know what you think. Because it don't look good for Indiana or Rutgers this year. Like, this is, this is going to be a brutal year. It absolutely is. All right. I think that is going to do it. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you again for all the support on the channel the YouTube page is growing like wildfire. It's awesome. Like, I, I love seeing it, especially before football season. We're not even into August yet, and it is just a massive numbers. So continue hitting that subscribe button, share the show out, tell your friends about it, and subscribe on the podcast. That one really helps out a bunch. Uh, YouTube, I love doing YouTube. I think it's so much fun to be able to converse back and forth, jump in the comments, etc. That's where I really enjoy it, but... Podcast has always been big for us. This show was a podcast before it was any kind of a YouTube show. So do us a favor again, share the show, subscribe, like the video, comment, all that fun stuff. Uh, and with that said, we'll be back again next week. But for now, take care of yourself, take care of each other, and hopefully all you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com. And if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter at GaryWCE at Chris B. Giannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.